Good afternoon, Vincent. We are now live. Good afternoon, and welcome to the webinar series of the FTTH Council Europe. My name is Vincent Garnier. I am Director General of the Council, and I will be moderating this webinar. Today's session is titled An Integrated Approach to Plan and Design, Understanding a Telco's Perspective. It is sponsored by Scient, a member of the FTTH Council. So we will start with some words uh, about our organization. We are a non-for-profit association with the mission to promote full fiber network as the most sustainable and future-proof broadband technology. The Council regroups 150 members throughout Europe. And among our key activity is the organization of the annual FTTH conference. The next one taking place on March 29 and 31st in Vienna, Austria. And you will find more information about the Council and our activity on our website. This session is part of a series of webinars we are organizing on a regular basis to provide uh, our audience with insightful content from uh, leading industry experts. Some practical information uh, before we effectively start. The session is recorded and a link to the replay will be sent to all registrants and participants after the event. You are muted as an audience, but you can send us questions using the question chat box. We will do our best to address them with our panel in the second part of the webinar. Now, the past two years, have proven how essential good connectivity is in our private lives and for our economies. We have also witnessed an unprecedented acceleration of fiber network rollout throughout Europe. We have now passed the 50% coverage threshold in Europe. This is great news, but it also means that half of the continent is still to be connected. Many alternative operators are investing in full fiber network, while incumbents are speeding up their development plans. With so much activity, it is crucial to pay attention to operations. Yes, we need to roll out fiber fast, but we should always do it with the highest standard of quality. This fundamental infrastructure is there for the next decades. We are doing this not necessarily only for ourselves, but more importantly, for our children, for our children and for the next generation. So this is why I believe today's discussion are particularly relevant. Our speakers will address emerging trends on fiber rollout and the existing design and development models. They will talk about alternative methodologies, technologies and tools for effective network build outs. And with a zoom on the situation of the Netherlands, uh, we will also share some more holistic consideration important to a good understanding of FTTH rollout. So without further ado, let me introduce you to our panelists. Uh, ladies first, I will start with Amrita Gamgotra, Managing Director of Ichuk Digital Solutions. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. And then uh, let me introduce you to Ariane Tenhove, is CEO of Volker Wessels Telecom based in Netherlands. Um, good afternoon, Ariane. Good afternoon. And finally, Rohit Kumar, who is head of strategy and communication at Scient, our sponsor for today. And I will uh, first ask uh, for Amita to, to walk us through. Um, the first of a short presentation we will have during the first part of the presentation of the session, after which we will open for question. Do not hesitate to ask the question in the chat area. We will address them uh, with the panel. So Amrita, the floor is yours. Let me know when you want me to, to pass to the next slide. Yes, please. Thank you again, Vincent, and good afternoon to the audience. 
good evening and good morning if they are joining us from, from Europe. Can you hear me? Yes, that's much better. Could you just repeat from the start, please? We didn't hear you for a second. Okay. So uh, thank you again, uh, Vincent, and good afternoon to the audience in Europe, and good evening uh, in the Asian countries and in the US. Good morning. My name, as you heard, is Amrita Gangotra, and I'm learning my firm, Ethiopia Digital Solutions. Before that, I held CPIO and CIO positions in Vodafone UK, Europe, and in part the Airtel in India. Ethiopia is a boutique consulting firm that works with clients globally, both in developed markets and emerging markets. It focuses on helping clients, enterprises, OEMs, and CSPs with the network transformation agenda required to make digital transformation effective. It also works with technology product companies with their go-to-market strategies with the evolving world uh, with the new technologies like 5G, AIML, blockchain, etc. So let's start with the obvious statement that every enterprise today, especially after the COVID pandemic has hit the world, is focusing on digital transformation, that is digitizing their business. Most organizations have pushed the business operations to be more online, have enabled employees to work from home, are building products and services that are being consumed in the cloud using latest technology. Now, one of the most common elements in the success of the digital transformation is connectivity. Customers or employees, if they are using a service or product that is being offered and their experience is not good because of the connectivity or the network that is available to them, the usage of that, uh, of that product or services becomes quite poor. So connectivity with good bandwidth and low latency is something that there is a huge demand for. More and more applications like gaming, IPTV, et cetera, requires more bandwidth and lower connectivity. Now, the for very good connectivity, the need of the hour is fiber. As you can see in the slide over here, when I compare the fiber optics with proper media, whether it is the bandwidth or whether it's because you, know, you have more um, better uh, immunity to EMI and RFI sustainability, whatever parameters you take, the choice is clear. We have to move towards copper. Now, when I look at copper, the word FTTX comes to the mind. But today, I mean, let's focus on, um, let's look at the FTTH, which is fiber to the home. And if you look at some of the statistics on the left, uh, you know, the communities that have, or they, that enjoy over 46% better business formation as compared to com communities that don't have fiber broadband services. When available, rural markets enjoy better average take rate, 63% for fiber broadband than urban. So there is a huge hunger in that sense in the rural markets also. And communities with over 60% SCTH availability have 64% better localized GDP. You just heard from Vincent also that in uh, Europe, the SCTH rollout is just about 60%. So really speaking, there is a lot of demand and a lot of hunger for fiber at to the home. But fiber rollout is not only to the home. So Vincent, if you go to the next slide, let me explain the different elements of fiber connectivity. It's about connectivity. Uh, and in the connectivity, there are different models where you're connecting the central office to different premises, different um, nodes. So, for example, on the most left hand side, you see fiber to the node, uh, which is basically you're connecting universities or businesses or remote places. Then uh, you're aware of the huge uh, rollout of 5G that is being announced, 4G has been rolled out. Even the wireless technology needs a lot of fiber to backhaul the huge amount of data that's getting generated into the core of the network. So you have cell site fiber that is required. So that's fiber to the site. And then of course, there's fiber uh, to the home. 
Now, when there are so many types of fiber connectivity that is required, the network design process is very, very important. You, when you start the whole process, there are a few steps that you have to move through. The first one is the fundamental planning part. Look at the existing network, look at what you want to the as is and the to be that you're transitioning to, and then create some manageable work packages. After that, you do need to look at the outside plant evaluation needs to be done, the civil work, identification of the current passive network elements, et cetera. Then you get onto the back end, uh, the plan and design. And that's mainly um, in the office uh, that you sit and start doing the planning and design, the high level design, and the low level design, which is mapping the street design, the street uh, information that you get, the underground cross section views, in house installation. So from high level to low level design, and then you start the implementation. And once the implementation happens, you need to then go back and capture the as is build. Uh, and update the inventory database and uh, information in GIS and other systems. And we'll go into the details of that uh, later on. Now, if you get to the next slide, uh, Vincent, um, there are a few critical success factors for the rollout of fiber, the SPTS. Of course, I mean, on technology side, um, you know, it's future proofing, there's maximum coverage that's there. The cost element is another factor. When you're rolling out fiber, you will need to look at the capex and opex, the workforce productivity, whether you're doing greenfield or brownfield. So the business case, it has to be developed business case by business case. And uh, very pointed areas have to be covered. Once you have decided uh, how this rollout is going to happen, the project management and the SLAs and mean time to repair, all these things become very, very critical. And then of course, we have to have the flexibility of the rollout, optimization of the truck rolls, et cetera. So these are some parameters and factors that need to be continuously optimized by CSPs or by any of the companies that are rolling out fiber. They have to collaborate with multiple uh, partners in this rollout cycle. And due to multiple handovers and lack of timely updates, there are real challenges as such. There are new ways of doing things, there are new tools, and the, the time here now is how do you do smart SPTX rollout? So let me hand it over to Rohit and uh, let him explain a few of the things that can be thought about in terms of tools and techniques. Go ahead. Thank you, Amrita. Um, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to all the participants, depending on which uh, region you're joining us from. Um, I lead the strategy function um, here at Science uh, Communications Business Unit. Um, Science is a multinational company, it's a global company. We, um, we work with uh, 300 plus enterprises. Communications is the largest business unit uh, wherein we serve close to about 35 uh, LCOs around the globe. My primary responsibility here is to draft the technology roadmap um, in line with the uh, market evolution and uh, accordingly work with the various internal and external stakeholders in order to make it a reality. And that's where the um, um, I work uh, closely with uh, Amrita as well as Aryan on those fronts. Like I said, uh, we have been working uh, with CSPs uh, in certain cases, serving them for more than two decades uh, in terms of their network evolution and network rollouts. Uh, and we have seen this, uh, this ecosystem and this value chain emerge over the years. Uh, so initially it started off more like a greenfield activity wherein uh, the demand was was uh, still in its infancy. And that's where uh, Amrita spoke about uh, the process from uh, survey to plan and design to handing it over to network operations and along the way doing uh, uh, the rollout both in the last mile as well as on the mid miles. But the inherent challenge over there was, or inherent uh, practice over there was uh, that build the network and the subscribers would come. That worked in the initial phases because uh, 
the demand was uh, still in its nascent stages and the ecosystem was evolving the 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 network hunger uh, the 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 demand the bandwidth hunger was still its, in its infancy but now you would have seen the kind of uh, network bandwidth demand that that has happened in the especially uh, uh, post the pandemic aid, uh, era in as per certain reports what we have seen is from, uh, compared to early 2020 the demand has gone up uh, close to about 25 percent or even more than that uh, in certain geographies clearly there is uh, now an enhanced need for the fiber to cater to these uh, uh, bandwidth needs the the other technologies can best be only adjunct to fiber but clearly fiber needs to take center stage and more more than that also the uh, the demand from the customers are all the more sophisticated people are demanding uh, the services and uh, solutions more precisely and more specifically in terms of what they are looking for so the initial traditional build out phase which was largely to build it and then the consumers would come in the subscribers would come in now that has given way to what we call as build it for subscribers or build for the demand um, of of the consumers and in that sense your end-to-end -end process yes the core processes would remain the same but then there is a need for all these processes to talk to each other there's a need for tighter coupling and integration between all these processes and that's where the technology plays a, 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 a greater role essentially what we are talking about here is uh, the 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 value chain needs to be disrupted by bringing in automation and analytics tools uh, integrating that with the geospatial technologies and all these technologies have also evolved over the years which which is now making it all happen so when we when we are really talking Talking about the digital transformation of next gen networks there are three aspects that uh, we are talking about which is primarily the the asset visibility in near re real time at best and in certain cases at real time or on real time basis the second is the improving data quality and i'm intentionally mentioning here as improving data quality and not an improved data quality and i'll touch upon that point in the in the next slide and obviously be reducing tcu uh, Vincent, if you can go to the next slide, please. So essentially what we are talking uh, over here is uh, data quality is of utmost importance. No matter what digital transformation you run, no matter what automation and analytics integration you want to do, data needs to be clean. And what we mean over here is that uh, the, the data coming from one system should tally with uh, with that present in the other systems the spatial data the attribute data that needs to link itself properly that needs to uh, give a holistic picture only then we will be able to save upon uh, the time the time that is currently wasted in sort of a swivel chair kind of an operation and uh, the the automation would uh, would become a reality in the true sense. So if we have to make the data quality uh, enhanced, we need to have, uh, we need to reduce the manual entry. We need to have tools and systems which can take the data from the field and then integrate that seamlessly back to the GIS system, uh, which, which is uh, your uh, Bible for, for the entire attribute data. But it, it can't be a one-time exercise and which is why i was uh, mentioning in the last slide that it is an improving data quality it needs to happen on a continuous basis it can't be done on a one-time basis it's a journey and that's where the data governance plays a lot of a, a, a big part in it which is why all the organizations need to come together and decide upon the roles and responsibility of each individual how how would the data be passed on from one system to the other? There needs to be accountability for each and every stakeholder in that process. Um, and that's where uh, if, if, if the data governance is set right, right from day one, that's where the data quality would be maintained as a hygiene factor rather than uh, doing it as a one-time exercise. The next slide, please. And in all this, um, the, the 
In second and most important element is the role of geospatial software. Um, and that plays a big part right from planning, right until the uh, management and operations bit of it. That's the, that's the place which is also getting disrupted. That technology is evolving at a similar sort of a pace uh, as uh, any other technology. We are increasingly seeing the use of LIDAR in field visits. Uh, I think in Europe, uh, based on certain reports, there is a 24% CAGR that we are talking about from now until 2025, which, which means that a lot of manual surveys will give way to LIDAR surveys. And then there are inherent advantages of going through this uh, LIDAR surveys, uh, right? Wherein uh, the, the, the kind of precision that you can get is as good as uh, the, the manual surveys. I, I believe there was a, a, a test uh, or an experiment done in uh, Western Pennsylvania, wherein they actually compared the data from a manual survey to a, a LIDAR survey, and the results were almost at par. The other advantage of LIDAR is it, it helps in terms of uh, easy collaboration because the data is already digitized. And then when you store it onto the cloud, a lot of these ecosystem players can start collaborating on a real-time basis. The second aspect uh, which, is, uh, which is prominent is that the, the CAD and the GIS portion, the, the, traditionally, we have used CAD software primarily for the design aspect of it. But then the GIS is more like a Bible for your for your records, right? Um, all your attribute data, all your spatial data is stored on the uh, on the GIS front. And unless and until there is a tighter integration of that, uh, we will always have this kind of loose ends uh, lying around here and there. So. The integration between the two systems, the CAD and the GIS system, is of utmost importance, and that's where uh, the, uh, the uh, integration uh, would, would help in terms of faster planning, faster design, and then accordingly also in terms of implementation and inventory management. To, to the next slide, please. Which means that if, if we look at this entire process, there there possibly is a need to look at this entire value chain more holistically rather than at a point services basis. Unless and until we look at this project uh, or, or this work holistically, we, our gains would only be limited from that standpoint. And that's where, we, in, in, in my uh, view, there is a need to consider the framework of managed fiber services provider in same lines as what we have as managed network services provider in the wireless world. Vincent, back to you. Well, thank you very much for it. And before I hand over to Ayan, I just want to remind to the audience that please do not hesitate to ask questions. Uh, within uh, five, ten minutes, we will uh, move to, to the, uh, the pure conversation between the panelists. So, uh, use the question box, uh, box, ask your question, we will address them in a moment. And now, Ayan, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you, Vincent. Um, good, yeah, good morning, uh, good evening, every participants in this uh, meeting. And uh, thank you, uh, Amarita, that you give more the architecture of Fiverr to the home. And uh, Rohit, you said uh, a lot about uh, the engineering. And typically, you asked me to do some introduction what we are as Volker Vessels in the Dutch market and what our yeah, what we main goals are in the five to the home markets. So, a short introduction. I'm Ayal Tanova, I'm CEO of Volker Vessels Telecom. And Volker Vessels Telecom is one of the biggest uh, main contractors of the operators in uh, the, the Dutch market for the fiber rollout, but also for other technologies. We do a lot of copper technologies, uh, mobile activities, and you see here, we have five divisions in our company for uh, all telecom activities that we have, also in Germany. And next between that, you see we have some technical companies who especially can help the fiber to the home business and also the telecom business with the goals or maybe the typical goals that we have in Holland. We have the main, you see the Mavexact, that's a ground penetrating radar. Here it is an IoT funnel and recognize the software platform. So this is Volker Vessels Telecom. We do rollout in Holland for many operators 
And also, we have a very strong cooperation and relationship with science. They invite us for this meeting, and both we are looking uh, also to the engineering part of this because there's a lot of engineering things to do. And Roy, thank you for your very clear talk about the engineering process. I think that we do a lot in this business. Maybe next slide, like we can understand some typical things. What we do, what are our FTDX condition and what's the Dutch market? Because uh, Vincent asked me, especially for this meeting, can you tell me now specifically what is now in the Dutch market, one of the topics in the fiber rollout? And you see last year in Holland, we connect 730,000 homes passed, not homes connected, homes passed, and we dig a cable into the ground. And I think so typically, 190, 200,000 of their homes, they are passed by Volker Vessels Telecom, and that's our mark share that we have. And so you can see that there's a very big amount if you look to the total amount of numbers to connect. And what is typically from that, if you look to the Dutch market, and what are challenges about that, is that what typically in the Dutch market is that the fiber to the home market is not protected by regulation, but it's regulations on the end customer, but not in rollout the infrastructure. So there are many participants in the Dutch market, yeah, some kind of private equities and some pension funds, they invest to uh, to roll out the networks. For some experience that we, we roll out in the past, the most houses in the period between 2007 and 2014, and after that, it stands stills. And two years ago, we, we started up this uh, engine again, and now we uh, uh, achieve this amount of numbers. And what is typically for us in the Dutch market that we dig the cables into the ground. And Amrita let show net uh, show before that a typical uh, infrastructure who need it in the fiber to the X market. But we see in Holland, that especially, uh, that is a very big uh, needed for fiber rollout. But we don't only do it for fiber to the home. And so typically we build a network for many operators. And what is suspiciously fiber to the home? There is a fiber uh, rollout that is very big. The growing demand for digitalization and networks is needed if you see in the COVID pandemic that people need good connections. They need good, if they have uh, fiber optics networks with no problems. And there's a lot of discussion about a lower capex to increase the speed of rollout of the networks. And, and, that, and the next point, what we see is if you um, make this huge amount of numbers, you pass a lot of infrastructure who's already in the ground. And we see that we, we like to minimize also the damage. And that's especially one of the things, if you dig with this speed so many uh, kilometers in the Dutch market, you see that we pass a lot of infrastructure. And sometimes it's not good on card, it's not good on engineering. The data, the GIS is not clear enough. So it needs a lot of innovation. And that is what we do last year. We spent a lot of time in ground penetrating radar so we can check if the GIS was good enough, if the network, old networks are good on the table, and how can we manage that by roll out a new infrastructure? Or maybe sometimes we roll out two fiber to home infrastructure in the same city. And it needs a lot of, I think, organization and designs to do it very fast and without damage. Maybe the next slide. And, but we also look as we are a subcontractor from the big operators like KPN, Vodafone, and so ODF is so one of the big, uh, one of the new uh, uh, challenger in the Dutch market, and T-Mobile. And if you look, we also look to our own goal that we have. And I like Amira, let's say to us, like to go to see what is fiber to the X. Well, what we saw now, we do a lot of fiber to the home, but if you look to our goal, and our goal is that we connect everything to the fiber, then we must believe, maybe we must look to fiber to the X, and maybe we can connect everything. And I think if you connect uh, a lot of business cases to the same network, then we can improve the quality of life for the citizens in the city. And what you now saw in the market, and also with, from design perspective, that we always do, sometimes we design networks two or three or five times. And if you look, what is the best for the humanity, then we believe our goal is total connectivity and connect everything on the fiber to the home network 
and then from data you can use the network for a smart city for a better quality of life and also uh, this picture what we sent is one of the pictures that we send in Eindhoven uh, there is an area that we connect everything and then you can see that I think the technology can help us to get a better life and also to get a better connection. That's my topic uh, for today. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, I am. Um, thank you, Arita. Thank you, thank you, Amrita. I would like now to to kick off the, I would say, the, the Q and A part of of our uh, of our conversation. Maybe starting with you, Amrita. Uh, you mentioned the importance of data. I would like to reverse the question and actually ask you how does inaccurate data uh, or how would inaccurate data impact the operation for a CSP? Thank you, Vincent. Uh, you heard a lot about the importance of data governance from Rohit. But uh, let me explain uh, you know, what happens if the data is inaccurate uh, in the various systems that a CSP ha has. Now, missing or incomplete uh, you know, connectivity information is actually a, quite a pertinent problem plaguing the industry. It is not uncommon that CSPs uh, don't have correct information about the data of about 15 to 20 percent of its customers. And when the problem is left unattended, it just aggravates, it, it just becomes larger. Not being able to identify accurately the location of network fault when a customer reports an outage, or being able to identify which customers are affected by a failed device directly impacts outage duration and restoration. Therefore, an impact on customer experience and customer satisfaction. So the telcos or the CSPs need to have the highest quality of street level data with robust asset data sets with ground truth accuracy, uh, which is less than even 10 centimeters. Because you know, keeping this accurate and updated in the geospatial system is fundamental for the need for the running operations and for the forward rollout of the FCTX while designing and looking at the network. If you are uh, having inaccurate GIS data, it leads to delayed as, uh, and costly network rollout also. The cycle just keeps increasing. The reliance on surveys and physical visits increases quite substantially. And that could take 15 to 30 days of provisioning and order fallout delays. Of course, there's the cost impact as well on inaccurate inventory. And it leaves uh, the stranded assets quite unattended. Actually, I've had experience before also where if we have got and governed the data well or cleaned it up, you can re harvest a lot of the data uh, of the uh, assets that are lying there. And it could then reduce your cost also. There are other challenges like if there is a redundant database because of MNA or different uh, GI systems when you do uh, mergers and acquisitions, which is quite common in Europe, as you would know. This leads to a lot of mismatches and therefore a lot of mismatches in reporting, even to the regulators or to the management. So overall, I would say the data governance and the data cleansing is a very important aspect of this entire plan, design, engineering, and operations of SAPX. Absolutely, thank you very much. And now maybe I'm um, turning to, to Rorit. Rorit, you, you spoke and explained what critical success factor of FTTX deployment could be, but what are, um, in your view, the challenges uh, to achieve success uh, in the FTTX rollout? Thank you, Vincent, for the question. Um, like I was explaining, uh, there is an inherent uh, design principle which has been followed until now. Um, there we normally the designers would use the CAD CAM based system called CAD system in terms of doing the design because the CAD system offers a lot more flexibility from that standpoint. But the record management is sitting in your GIS database. And that's a more like a database schema, defined rules, there are constraints. So obviously one is one, both of both the systems need to be there, but then one 
system need to talk to each other and then there is an overlay problem that uh, most of the survey partners or or the construction partners would carry paper based maps onto the field and they would do the red lines based on the construction that they do or based on uh, any management activity that they would do so all these three systems need to talk to each other and typically there is always a lag the, the lag could be if you don't use a technology based tools uh, the lag could be as much as uh, one day to two days and in certain cases there are missed updates which amrita was also speaking about there could be chances of uh, manual errors uh, while inputting the data and that means that the as built data or as uh, versus the as planned data there is always uh, some sort of a catch up or some sort of a miss between the two and that is something which which leads to and like i was explaining swivel chair operation in um, increase in the design time increase in the uh, uh, build time and and stuff like that the other problem is uh, when when there are so many disparate systems and some of them are uh, even legacy systems which uh, the csps don't want to touch uh, right the real time visibility of the data end to end or of the network end to end that is uh, typically missing and that is that hampers your speed of deployment on one side also in terms of uh, speed to restore or speed to even identify the faults before restoration those kind of uh, delays are in in the current day and uh, world could be detrimental to your customer success it could lead to enhanced churn from your customers and that is something that is a big challenge uh, um, that is there prevalent right now and primarily if you if you look at uh, the end to end uh, fiber rollout process it's a it's a cumbersome process it's it takes a lot of time in some matrix was suggesting that um, every 16 hours uh, you need to connect 1000 plus home passes and that number is going to become all the more aggressive going forward because of the enhanced needs from the customer so you need to imbibe the philosophy of automation and automation is something where, which has to be taken taken in a bespoke manner depending on your context because you can have some of the systems talking uh, over mainframes mainframe based technology some of the systems could be uh, talking to uh, your cat system some of the systems would be primarily gis based all these technologies need to be looked at holistically and then automation needs to be planned out back to okay. you once thank you um I would like to to ask to to Aryan and maybe uh, you know as a continuation of where you left your presentation I, I noted that you used the term FTTX rather than FTTH and you you see um I would say access network as one unified uh network so could you maybe elaborate a little bit and maybe um give you give us your view on the possible synergies between um mobile network backhaul transport to um wireless antenna and increasingly 5g and the ftth we are currently rolling out both ftth uh, network and also preparing for the development of 5g at the ftth council we made some research to show that there is a lot of gain in approaching both investment in synergy I, i'm very interested to get your view on that as well Well, thank you, Vincent. A good question. Um, and our appointment on that is um, it maybe it's typical in Holland, but uh, I think it's global uh, thing that there are existence networks who deliver um, um, uh, some 4G and sometimes a, a, a copper network who needs connection for for um, for internet. And what you saw is that we typically design a lot of networks from the the old network to the new network so we built an, an couple connection a home network to the fiber to the home proposition and if you look to a broader perspective and you look to a city and a city needed fiber they also needed fiber for 5g and you see that for, that, that, that that mobile and fixed networks are more connected to one uh, design and that's typically what rohit said before about the gis if you look to the gis uh, networks you already exist why did we build a network 
who connect also uh, maybe lamp poles, uh, street lighting, and other optics. If you then you have more possibilities to roll out uh, maybe a fine base network for 5G in the in the future. But what you saw is that, and uh, what I saw in the discussion that we started before, that a lot of business cases are based on CAPEX and OPEX. So what you see is that we design a lot of networks for one solution, sometimes fiber to the home. But if you have a global perspective and you look to a municipality, then you see that there's a lot more connection. But sometimes the business cases are not in the same time, same area, and same infrastructure. So I think if you design more for a higher perspective, you must sometimes have spare in your network to do the fiber rollout, maybe from fiber to the site. And you can, can connect uh, a node from 5G on the, uh, on, the, on, the, on the fiber to the home network. So if you look so to architecture, yeah, the only um, dimension rule that we have on fiber to the home is the speed of light. So you can connect everything, um, but you have to be aware that your business case is not only fiber to the home. And I think that's one of the challenges for the operators. Business cases for today is not a business case for tomorrow. And uh, that is one of the topics that we said that we call it fiber to the X. I think now we do fiber to the rollout in Holland for a lot. But I think the next phase is to make smart cities and make fiber to the X. And sometimes we have to design more fiber to the X. And from that perspective, look back to fiber to the home. That's another way of thinking. Very interesting. Thank you very much. And Amrita, I think you, you just mentioned copper, and uh, I would like to ask you a question related to copper switch off. We see in some European country, and we see some operators starting to develop plan for phasing out copper. Um, it's not necessarily an easy process. And so how should the copper switch off and the fiber rollout program effectively be, be managed? And what is your view on some of the major, major challenges to be uh, cognizant of? Yeah, Vincent, I mean, uh, it's easier said than done. These are mega projects, multi-year projects, uh, and a lot of stakeholders uh, are um, involved in this. Uh, the vendor ecosystem is also very large. And then customers, the end customers are involved. So uh, if I look at the challenges, I would really bucketize them in three areas. The first and foremost are the regulatory concerns or the constraints, I would say. So, uh, you know, in some of the markets, you have this uh, obligation, the universal access fixed service uh, obligation that has to be there, which is based on the copper network and, you know, transitioning through that. There are wholesale providers that the incumbent has to cater to. And if the wholesale customers have also co invested, then if there's a mismatch, um, then it is very hard to, um, you know, uh, follow the obligations that are there as far as regulations are concerned. The second thing in regulations, I would say that, you know, you have to have the local municipality um, um, approvals. And that is quite a challenge. You need the buy-in and you need the right-of-way permissions. It takes a long time, the necessary permission to switch off, switch on, dig, all of that is quite a big um, challenge as such. The second challenge I would say is mainly the organizational challenge. Now, uh, when you're executing such a large program, multi-year program across the country, across different location, nationally, coordinating with internal and external um, you know, stakeholders, communication, uh, it is, uh, you know, quite challenging. Um, you know, while there are a lot of synergies in the copper switch off with the fiber rollout, it requires a very defined transformation structure to be put in place for the duration of the execution. It's not uncommon for operators to hire temporary specialist staff to handle this transformation. And thirdly, but not the least, it's the customer wise migration issues that we face. You know, migration, migrating each and every customer from the legacy network to the new network is an enormous planning, communication, and logistic hurdle. There are high risks of customer churn, but at the same time, there is an opportunity to upsell higher value products to the customer. Managing the public uh, image is another thing that uh, is, is very relevant and, uh, you know, quite challenging sometimes. 
but as one of the nordic uh, telecom cto once said that it is not about the 300000 homes that were successfully migrated during the switch off that determined the success of the migration it was also the handling of the public relationship the public relations and the fallout that might have occurred with the homes that had problems during the migration the company sought active uh, engagement with relevant stakeholders customers and mitigated the ne negative articles in the press so all in all you know uh, while there is a wow factor uh, for moving and upgrading the product it is a challenging and mega transformational project really Vincent? thank you uh, maybe back to you right you I, I noted from from your presentation that you, you were talking about managed fiber service provider um, as an important point. Uh, is there anything you want to to elaborate on uh, concerning this specific uh, topic? Sure. Actually, um, I am taking the leaf out of uh, the prevalent practice currently, which is primarily in the OEM space uh, and for wireless rollouts, wherein the CSPs hand over the entire network management, deployment and management uh, to the OEMs. And these are mega projects and then uh, the CSPs would, would monitor it uh, and they will have a single mechanism and that's where it's the managed network services uh, uh, play over there if you look at the process it is equally complex and we all spoke about it uh, at length uh, in, in during this webinar as well right and we have just scratched the surface the, the fact that there are so many disparate elements uh, so many disparate systems all the end entire process needs to be looked at holistically rather than on a piecemeal basis oftentimes if we address try to address the problem on a piecemeal basis the results will also be in the similar light and hence there is a need to look at the entire process entire value chain more holistically so starting with uh, what amrita mentioned about the copper switch off program that is a is a, a whole, is a complete end-to-end uh, -end process that needs to be looked at. And apart from that, there needs to be a phase-out plan as well, uh, because there is a there needs to be an overlap between your copper network and your fiber network. There is, a, uh, there is an OPEX uh, cost, which you will be incurring as a service provider if you keep both the networks running. But at the same time, you can't switch off uh, and there, there, there is uh, no overlap uh, between the two. So at the same time, how do you manage, uh, how do you strike that balance? That's the key question uh, to mull over. The second aspect is, uh, especially in the urban and semi-urban area, the congested areas, uh, not, not every time fiber feasibility would be, would be uh, possible and plausible. Now, what do you do in that kind of a context? Because fiber is something which which is the only uh, media that is only alternative that is there right now, which can cater to the bandwidth demands, right? There needs to be a aggregation of technologies. There needs to be a, 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 a mix of technology which has to be rolled out. Can we look at uh, FWA? Can we look at uh, migration to an IP kind of an infrastructure wherein the need of fiber rollout is reduced from that perspective? And that's something which, if you look at the program holistically and only then you will be able to decipher. The, the third aspect is primarily from uh, what's happening currently in Europe. There is a lot of, uh, uh, initiatives running wherein people want to ride over a shared infrastructure. Now, if you need to uh, do an effective planning of your entire network, you need to have an integrated system with a wholesale provider as well as uh, from a CSP perspective in terms of understanding where those ducts are there which which are shareable, where, where are those uh, uh, what is that shared infrastructure which can be leveraged? And basis that you can create an effective design which will work both, both in terms of uh, technology uh, or the cost as well as from a time perspective. And that is something which is which needs to be also looked at. 
if you only look at uh, plan and design process in in isolation or uh, survey process in isolation you are never going to get a holistic view of things and that's where the efficiency would only be there on a piecemeal basis from that perspective okay very clear thank you um i am i noted you you're also active in germany uh and germany is by far the largest um potential in terms of uh, fiber rollout for for the years to come. Uh, there are there are many many households to still to be connected, and it's a it's a huge uh, country. Um, is there any any takeaway uh, you have from your experience of the German market, and maybe share what are the challenges you're facing there? Now, if you as a as a Dutch company go to Germany, you think also also Dutch people like they they have the the clear view about the market. But if you look to the German market, you look especially to the fiber to the home, you see there's a, a huge country with a lot of numbers to connect. But typically you saw that the infrastructure is re really uh, region-based and also the oper operators are re uh, region-based and also the rules to dig cables into the ground and the local municipalities make the, the lands more complex then then we look to holland and what is uh, we have more uh, regulated rules uh, for the, for digging and also rollout fiber network so this is one of the thing the second is that the infrastructure uh, is less if you look to the big cities there's a lot of infrastructure but if you look to the rural area between the big cities there, there is not an existing network like copper or coax so you need to invest uh, a huge amount of meters digging cables into the ground before you uh, you arrange the city to to roll out fiber so that's one of the things and second one of the thing is that the capacity to roll out uh, the works the work squad you need is now it's it's a new market for there so if the amount is high and, uh, and there, uh, there are not a lot of technical people to do that um, they're already working in the infrastructure who is copper or otherwise so you have to think um otherwise to 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 this challenges that over there and if you look to the designer perspective there are a lot of cars who are not available so that we we drive in a lot of cities with cars like the google cars and we make pictures of uh of houses and also pictures of pavements and pictures of uh things so we can design a network so we make new cars over there to design a network and that's one of the challenges so i think your question is very clear if you look the market is very big so you can use your experience from holland and bring them to germany to have a very good business case but you must uh, think like a german and then you can uh, locally base your capacity and then you can start with the mm. fiber rollout so it's very complex to, to do that um, and if you look to the mobile perspective and you combine those things yeah, I think if you 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 uh, you go to your question you had before, can you combine the mobile activities and fiber activities? I think that is needed in uh, in Germany to combine uh, both things because there is a lot of need for mobile activities, but also to connect the mobile uh, land posts to the fiber to the X network. So there's a lot of challenges, um, but I think that capacity and also um, the need of what they have in Germany, uh, it's very, it's a very good market to stay on that uh, and, uh, and 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 make a lot of uh, new networks over there. Yeah, I guess you're right. Every every country in Europe has a specificity. You can't you just copy paste and, and imagine that it will work uh, similarly well. But all countries are faced with that question of um, maybe lack of of skill labor to to be able to uh, indeed uh, roll out as fast as uh, I would say the plan would, uh, would hope. Um, yeah, what you, and, what you saw and, is that- you, you, You're directly uh, in, in, uh, in direct contact with that challenge as well. Yeah, and what you see is that there are a lot of countries who needed a lot of amount of numbers of fiber. And if you look to the regulation, but also in traineeship, how to train the labor uh, companies and, and and how to manage the labor costs uh, that's one of the thing and and i think um yeah 
it's like some kind of workaround to go between Europe and from Holland and Germany and now to Belgium. Uh, there's a lot of fiber needs, so we also have to arrange a work squad who can uh, make these challenges uh, available. Vincent. Okay. And I'll, I'll take that as your conclusion, if you mind, don't mind, uh, Ayan, and, and use the, the, the remaining uh, three, four minutes we have in our session, maybe to ask uh, Amina to, 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 to share your, your conclusion uh, about this session, about any consideration you would like to, uh, to express to, to the audience today. Mm. Did you ask me the question? Yeah, yeah, sorry, I was asking you, uh, yeah. we are close yeah. to, to, to the end of the session, so if there is a, a few words you would like to, to say to conclude uh, your contribution. Yes, please. Yeah, thanks, uh, Vincent. As we, as we were just discussing, while, you know, we've seen that fiber uh, is very much required, there is a hunger and need for more bandwidth, so fiber is absolutely critical. But uh, given the various challenges we discussed, um, also, uh, the labor shortage actually, and the labor training that needs to be done, which you touched upon in the end, uh, and the data integrity, uh, there there has to be a focus and a and a manner in which we can uh, program manage it well. Number one, number two, a lot of automation and a lot of uh, uh, process uh, automation. Uh, there has to be a way to do this more smartly, which Rohit was talking about, you know, the tools and, and other aspects. So considering all of that, challenging times ahead, but very much required. I think most of the, um, you know, CSPs and other companies in Europe will gain from this rollout that is required. Well, thank you very much. And maybe turning to you, Rohit, uh, for the final world, um, what are your, 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 your key uh, takeaway from uh, from this discussion of today? Um, I actually uh, quite enjoyed this session, uh, especially the perspective uh, for from the various uh, markets, uh, which Aryan uh, mentioned uh, specifically from a Netherlands and Germany perspective, and how uh, the various technologies are getting used. What is what is the on ground challenges from that standpoint? And um, Amrita's perspective on best practices to be adopted actually um, i would uh, i think um, there is a there is a need for us to relook at that entire value chain and evaluate how 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 and what kind of optimization and efficiency gains can be had from that entire process? Where are those bottlenecks? And unless and until we have a visibility of that entire value chain, where are those congestion points? Where are those bottlenecks? We will not be able to fix them. And that requires tighter integration between the systems, tighter integration both from on-field as well as desktop-based uh, crew. And uh, looking at it uh, more holistically than it what it is uh, than what's happening right now. Well, thank you very much. Um, so many questions still to address, um, and I, I see a lot of um, opportunity to bring smart solution to help uh, all European countries develop better and faster uh, FTTH until we, we have a holistic. Uh, coverage, uh, connecting everything everywhere, Ayan, to, to build that uh, general communication network you, you think uh, and you explain is so essential for, for the future of, our, um, of Europe and, and the communities in Europe. So I guess you, we also, you didn't really touch about it, but the question of sustainability is also uh, everywhere uh, underlined in, in everything you, you said that is also essential. Uh, to, to take into account in the, in the rollout and those networks will be also instrumental to, to be able to, to, to take up the, the challenges of, uh, of climate change. So I would like to, uh, to thank uh, the panelists, thank our audience um, and uh, wish you a good rest of your day. Uh, stay tuned, more webinar session uh, will come in, in the weeks to, uh, ahead of us. So um, we'll have the opportunity to talk again and share with you a very insightful contribution from our experts. Thank you very much. I thank you very good day. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Goodbye. Bye.